RFD TV's Rural Education Special is brought to you by the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. The idea is to have the world be healthy. Every child in rural America should have access to a quality education. The values and the commitment that I see in rural communities and, and from rural educators is absolutely inspiring. I'm very, very optimistic about where we need to go, and the collective leadership here is a big reason why. Welcome to the Rural Education Special. I'm Dr. Rod Berger with American Ed TV. Join us as we take a deep dive into the Rural Education Forum here in Columbus, Ohio, talking about the needs of 50 million adults and 12 million students in our education's environments. I mean, I've gone to this school for ever since I was in kindergarten, Anthony Wayne Local School, so I mean the community has been great. Education, I think they teach me everything they need to teach me and more, you know. You get more personal school, like personal skills and at a rural school. More attention, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let, let's touch on aspiration. There are a lot of folks who think that if you live in a rural environment that automatically means that you have less resources and mm -hmm. that you might not you might not really aspire as much uh, or around the same dreams as somebody in a big city with lots of resources. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I mean in meeting you I would imagine that you have the exact same kinds of dreams and even bigger than those kids that maybe are in a very large school in a very metropolitan area. Yeah. You know um, I just want to grow up, get a good job, you know, have a good family, you know, I don't want to, I'm not all into the big cities, and I think that's very intimidating to me. I want to stay, stay around the rural community. And Is that what most of your friends want to do? Because there is, you know, there's a segment of the, mm -hmm. uh, the adults that are trying to, you know, fix everything with policy and money, yeah. right, that say, we've got to be careful because the Olivia Bainfelts, you know, <laughs> are going to leave. Well, um, uh, quite a few of my friends graduated last year, actually, and a few of them went away to college, like some even in other states, like in Michigan and um, Kentucky. One of my friends went to Colorado. And, you know, quite a few of them actually want to come back next year. They miss, they miss it, you know. They went off to college. They were excited to go to college. They wanted to get out. But, I mean, they want to come back. They miss it around the rural, so. So it sounds like they see the... They get outside of it. They yeah. experience that, right? It's sort of like a, yeah. a an extended vacation, but mm -hmm. they really understand the value of what it is to be exactly. home. Exactly, to be home. Let's close with this. Uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about technology. I mean, that, that's sort of the you know the, the exciting thing for everybody, mm -hmm. young and old, is technology and their tablets and Facebook and Twitter and all exactly. of these sorts of things. Where does technology fit for you and your school? And are you seeing that in what your teachers are, are providing for you with regards to lessons in the class? Yeah, I mean, actually, most of my classes are moving to tech, technology, like based teaching. Like in my one class, it's um, you have to go home and actually watch a video on what he put together that day during school. And then during school, you're sitting in class and you're on the laptops and you're doing stuff for, um, you know, your project. And then once you actually go home, you have to go back online and watch the video on what, you know, the lecture would have been during the class. So, I mean, there's iPads, computers, it's in just about every class, too, now. There's, they're even putting Apple TVs up to connect, like, their iPads with the Apple TVs in the classroom. So, I mean, coming from a rural community, I think that's going pretty far for... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what's next? Are you going to be on Ellen, The View? Like, what's next, Olivia? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> You'll start here, right? Right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we'll touch that. base next year. It was a pleasure to meet you, Olivia. <laughs> Continued you success. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. These teachers were always there. They had seen uh, our brothers and sisters go through. Uh, that was either a good or a bad thing, depending on how well that they had done. They knew your parents backwards and forwards. They knew, they had watched you grow up and also when you were handed off from class to class, those teachers shared with one another what were the strengths and what were the weaknesses of these students. 90% of the kids in my Coles class went to and graduated from college, 90%. You won't find a percentage like that probably anywhere in the country. There's no question. Do kids work harder for somebody they think cares about them 
and somebody who pays attention to what their interests and passions are and helps them to discover them? The answer is, duh. How do we intentionally do this? There's something about I've laughed that eHarmony does a better job of matching up disparate adults than we try to do with kids and teachers and their interests. But why wouldn't we do that? The one thing that everybody in the world wants is a good job. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Welcome to Creo Studio. So, what is Creo Studio? Creo Studio is a video-based creative arts program using the tablet to make new and creative ways to express yourself through art making. World-renowned artist and designer Paul Hamilton teaches you how to express yourself more creatively. And the Creo team teaches you all the tools you need to make meaningful art. Go to creostudio.org today and order yours now. Hi, my name is Paul Hamilton and I am an artist. Welcome to Orange Couch. What is Orange Couch? Orange Couch is a video-based creative arts program. This is not arts and crafts time. This is real art, real ideas. Every time you order Orange Couch, you're going to receive quality art materials to reach your creative goals. So everything you need is going to be right here and right here. Go to orangecouch.org today and order yours now. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Welcome back to the Rural Education Forum, brought to you by Battelle for Kids and the Ohio Board of Education. Schools cannot do this by themselves. It is part of a team that includes government and business and philanthropy. We have to do this together. That is the only way we get better. Good schools and good communities go hand in hand. It's hard to have one without the other. Can we take a success story with the incubator and break that down or look retrospectively at the education that they received in a rural community to see areas of need with regards to being a business owner? As far as their education? Yeah, they, they, meaning maybe what they either uh, were not privy to or exposed to and or areas that yeah. they were strong that you didn't maybe think that they yeah, might be. Yeah, good. That's a really good question. It, typically what happens is the K-12 system or even the higher ed system isn't preparing people for entrepreneurship. They're typically preparing them for some kind of specific skill. And I think that's one of the challenges we're having is kind of what I want to talk about today in the in the panel is that we aren't preparing our entrepreneurs or even just our, our society in general for leadership and creativity. They're typically learning specific skills. So um, a typical scenario is somebody has a specific skill. They may be a policeman, they may, may be an engineer, and it's through that that they come up with an idea for a business. So they're great at that side of things. They may be an engineer and they're great at that technology, but they have no clue how to run a business or how to lead a group of people. And so if, if, our, if our school systems were able to create more curriculum, more education on leadership and creativity and problem solving, I think that would be a good thing for our, for our nation as a whole. My mom walked out and she said, you have got to show your dad that you are able to go to college. Do you think that you could actually build a rocket. I thought by all the evidence around me, including defense, which was still on fire, <laughs> that the answer was no. And that was about to leap out of my mouth and she just put her finger on my nose and she said, I am counting on you 
build a rocket. And so I did. Our wonderful science teacher, Miss Riley, at Old Big Creek High School down there in McDowell County in southern West Virginia, and how she had not only inspired us, but pushed us to be as good as we could possibly be. Miss Riley went out and procured us a book called um, The Fundamentals or Principles of Guided Missile Design, which required a working knowledge of calculus, differential equations, and, and complex variables. I personally was having trouble with algebra at the time. But because I wanted to learn it so much, um, because we were so into this rocket building and also the idea that not only were we building rockets, we were going to build ourselves into a career path that would lead us all to college. I happen to have a remarkable high school Latin teacher. A remarkable high school Latin teacher who saw something in me when others may have not. It was because of Mrs. Heller that I stand here before you today as state superintendent of schools. And we need more Helen Hellers in our rural school systems today. And we must make available all the resources that teachers need to deliver relevant, usable information to their students. First off, people who want to be teachers, their, their heart is... Their heart is so in it, and and what you know, I I love them for want to making it for want to make a difference in the lives of other people, and the fact that they want that should be cherished in and of itself, and then we have to create the supports, including the pay, the tools, the time, the trust, the teamwork, um, to make that um, to make a, a teaching career um, something that 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 not that is not simply inspiring but that really works for both them and the kids they serve. So that's our collective obligation, not just to think that you can just plop somebody in, throw them the keys, and say, do it. You know, we need to have a lot more John, we, we need the country to be, to believe in a lot more John Deweys in terms of education, rather than John Wayne's. John Wayne could have been great in terms of old Hollywood movies. <laughs> But when you're talking about education, you need a lot more John Dewey's. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Welcome to Creo Studio. So, what is Creo Studio? Creo Studio is a video-based creative arts program using the tablet to make new and creative ways to express yourself through art making. World-renowned artist and designer Paul Hamilton teaches you how to express yourself more creatively. And the Creo team teaches you all the tools you need to make meaningful art Go to creostudio.org today and order yours now. So look, I, I think that um, like the president has spent a lot of time saying we're testing too much, which is absolutely right. We want him to change his, um, his education policies um, to actually be more aligned with his rhetoric. Um, we have said in our last um, convention we put Arnie Duncan on an improvement plan. Said, you know, yes, equity is really important. And making sure that kids who get the least, half our kids in public schools are poor. How are we going to actually make sure that they get the resources that they need? How are we going to actually make sure that, um, that, that if you say that testing is sapping out the joy of learning in schools and sapping out the oxygen, how are you going to make that a reality instead of the policies right now that have actually promoted testing? How are we going to make sure that we change the climate here so that teachers are lionized and, um, and, and revered as opposed to reviled? That's the things that we're asking them to do. We, totally support them in their push on, you know, affordability in, in college, on early childhood, um, but we need them to actually be the champions of public education as a public good, as an anchor of democracy. Randy, let's close with this. I can't help but see the parallels between the feeling of, of 
a group that might be disenfranchised and, and needing to find a voice, uh, even if it's not fair, but just the way maybe they're positioned uh, mm -hmm. in the circumstances. And we're here at the Rural Education Forum. So, right, thinking exactly about right. underserved populations. Right. So where do you see that as a parallel to your membership and working in a profession that is constantly, at least in this country, looking for a platform, looking for a voice that's representative of them, much like the rural communities here in the U.S.? You know, so I think what happens in the United States these days is that there's a lot of fear and anxiety. And that, you know, and, and the last recession in some ways made it worse. The economy is changing hugely, and our society has sometimes just, you know, when, when a business leaves a community, just picks up, leaves the community where it is, as opposed to understanding that we have a responsibility to all of our communities. And I think you're seeing that in rural areas. I hear it and see that in urban areas as well. What we're trying to do is say, look, everybody needs a voice. We're all in it together. That is the American value. The American value is how do you create a pathway to middle class? How do you create opportunity? How do you erect the ladder so that people can climb up it? But you have to erect the ladder. That's what always, that always was the potential of America, and that's what we need to get back to. But it's not an us versus them, it's us all in it. And having enough kind of power and voice to actually make sure that those issues get heard. So I'm really delighted to be at a conference on rural education um, and to talk about what we've done in McDowell as a way of giving voice. It all comes down to voice, trust, and dignity. If people feel, whoever they are, like they have real voice in their own lives and in their communities, if they feel like they have a path to dignity, if they trust that the politicians really do believe that we have to be all in, not just you know the people who fund campaigns are the ones that get hurt, but everyone. I think we change the country a lot, and that's why we're so engaged. I know you've been really busy today talking about you know, key issues in rural education, but I would like to reflect with you on your five years. I would imagine that the education narrative for you personally has changed or altered a little bit, even back to your days in Chicago. What have you learned as secretary that you think can be valuable to all of us as now education is really at the forefront, forefront of so many kitchen tables? Well, today I think it sort of exemplifies uh, so much of what I love about this job and how inspiring it is. So earlier this morning, I talked to a number of fantastic rural teachers. I just met with an amazing group of superintendents from the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative. They're doing remarkable work. And the challenges across the nation are significant and real. Lack of funding, lack of resources, lack of investment in rural communities. Retaining great teachers is difficult. Challenges around technology. Um, making sure parents understand the importance of getting a great education. So none of these are easy, but I just see the values of rural educators, the, the grit and the resourcefulness and the commitment to community. I see the results that educators are getting for children in terms of higher achievement. Um, and so for all the challenges we need to address, I'm very, very hopeful about where the country's going. And when you step back, high school graduation rates are at all-time highs, 80% for the nation, dropouts rates down, more young people not just graduating but going on to college. So a long way to go, a lot of hard work ahead of us, but I couldn't be more proud of what teachers and principals and superintendents and parents and very importantly students themselves are doing to educate themselves and to commit to building a positive future. What I do think is we have to do everything we can to elevate and strengthen the teaching profession. And we have to raise the prestige. We have to respect teachers to a much greater degree. I've been very public and talked about today we need to pay great teachers and great principals significantly more money. Not that anyone goes into education to make a million dollars, but it's a valued, critically important profession. And so I do think it's incumbent upon all of us to do everything we can to highlight the great work that teachers and principals and social workers and counselors are doing. As a nation, I always say a great military is our best defense, but our best offense is the great education system. And if we want strong families, if we want strong uh, communities, if we want to keep good jobs in our communities and in the United States, we have to educate our way to a better economy. If we want more social mobility, we have to do that through high quality education. So the answer is so many of our challenges are uplifting and strengthening public education and teachers. A lot of focus obviously is on the rural environment. That's why we're all here today in Columbus, Ohio. 
Uh, Rural Farm uh, District Television, RFD-TV, is doing a lot of focus on this as well and profiling what's going on in, in rural communities. What messages do you have for the family in a rural environment that says, I want my child to have access to the same technology, the same resources and curriculum that a child in a metropolitan area has? What do you say, not only just as secretary but as a father? Yeah. So, yeah, as you said, my wife and I have two young children, mm -hmm. so this is very, very uh, personal. Um, we have to continue to increase access to technology. In some places, we're in a great spot in rural America. In other places, there's a tremendous lack of access. And it, from uh, the FCC, uh, $2 billion already going out to increase access. We're hoping that that number will grow. So we want to continue to push hard there. But I would say to, to rural families and to rural parents that nothing's more important than your child getting a world-class education. And for me, it's never choosing whether they go to college or whether they go into the world of work. They have to be prepared to be successful in either, whatever their passion is. So all of us as parents have to step up. We have to partner with our children's schools. We have to partner with our children's teachers. We have to have the highest of expectations. And the only way our children are going to have better futures than what we have is if they have a great, great education. So nothing is more important. We have to make sure that geographic remoteness and connectivity issues do not limit learning opportunities for rural students. We have to ensure the broad connectivity rural districts need to keep their teachers up to date on professional development. Rural school districts with connectivity can offer everything online that any other school district can make available. If you are what you eat, you are what your eyes, ears, and heart consume. We are what we feed each other. We are thoughts and spirits forever rising anew. If you are what you eat, then you can be what you choose. The power to change your health, your life, your world lies only inside of you. Hi, my name is Paul Hamilton and I am an artist. Welcome to Orange Couch. What is Orange Couch? Orange Couch is a video-based creative arts program. This is not arts and crafts time. This is real art, real ideas. Every time you order Orange Couch, you're gonna receive quality art materials to reach your creative goals. So everything you need is gonna be right here and right here. Go to orangecouch.org today and order yours now. Rural communities often feel like they are isolated and kept from the national spotlight. That's not the case here at the Rural Education Forum. You've been working hard to be a part of this event and to bring to light rural education. Well, it's really important. You know, I came from rural Ohio, North, rural Northwest Ohio, so I have a special place in my heart uh, for rural schools. I have an understanding of some of the problems and issues that exist there. And sometimes, you know, to be honest, uh, with the focus on urban schools, that we sometimes overlook poverty and the needs in rural schools. And that's one of the reasons that the Ohio Department of Education is co-sponsoring this event with Patel for Kids. I'm glad you brought up poverty. I feel like it's sort of that dirty little word that we don't want to talk about because it, it's such a big word, meaning how do we solve the problem? How do we provide support? But isn't it really an important variable in this narrative about how to support rural education? It is huge. And I think that as we, if we try to fix a problem without dealing or addressing issues of poverty and jobs, then we're really short-sighted. And I think you heard some of that at our conference today with the focus is that, you know, we need to increase the skills and the knowledge of our students, but we also need to tie that to real jobs in, in real places so people uh, can continue their families and support their families. Dick, talk a little bit about local control, uh, and you know, states have different approaches to education. Mm -hmm. I'm of the mindset that to be able to have local communities have a stake in mm -hmm. uh, action plans it can be a benefit because they know their people, their students, mm -hmm. their teachers best. Where do you stand on that? Obviously, Ohio is a local control state, and we're very supportive of that. As a superintendent of a local school district for close to 30 years, I always believe that it's always more powerful that if the ideas come from our community bubbling up rather than being prescribed by Columbus or Washington. Uh, ownerships there, commitments there, uh, and the uh, State Department of Ed should be there supporting that, but the ideas and, and uh, commitments should be come from the local levels. What can we do together better than we could do individually? Our country won't survive. I don't believe if we are not able to bring the raw intelligence, if you will, and the culture of the rural environment to our 
nation as, as a whole. Everywhere I go, I see the challenges, I see the difficulties, but I see the hard work, I see the commitment, I see the values that so many rural educators live every single day. And those are the values that are going to strengthen not just those communities, those values are going to strengthen our nation. It doesn't take a lot to create uh, access, to create a passion, to create a persistence when you know it's there. And it is there. And there was a story about Churchill replying, I'm sure history will be kind to me because I plan to write it. That's the real thing that we need to do. We need to write the rural narrative.